Today's episode of the podcast is a rum talking special featuring rum legends Richard Seal of Foursquare Distillery, Barbados, and Christelle Harris of Hamden Estate, Jamaica. We met up in October 2019 during their visit to London for its rum week. In our discussion, they touch on their origin story and how they got into the business. We talk rum branding, rum classification. They tell us about the different proof points that the market demands in their rums. We get a deep dive into Hamden Estates' legendary fermentation process. They discuss the potential audience for rum. And they talk media in spreading the rum message. Enjoy. The family business, uh, you know, we got into rum as, you know, merchant traders, which was the, the common way of bottled rum um, back in the day. Uh, distillery estate and, and bottler were always separate. So we did other things besides rum, but rum was, uh, or we, to be precise, we traded other than rum, but rum was the only thing we did that was ours. So it was always a very important part of the business. I uh, can't underestimate that, but it wasn't necessarily uh, that I would be involved, um, heavily involved or heavily involved in the production side. Uh, I mean, for example, my father was much more involved on the marketing side than the production side. Mm-hmm. Um, my, uh, whereas it was a little bit different from my grandfather. Um, so, yes, I, as you say, I was always going to be involved. But um, what happened was in, I, you know, while I'd worked in the, the sort of the family business, as you do in Christmas and summer holidays, uh, I officially joined in 93 and what happened that year is um, my father made the acquisition of the Martin Dorley brand, which is a very, very sort of famous uh, Barbados brand. And that really changed everything because that made the rum even more critical uh, part of the business. And I think that was, so that just turned out to be the right timing then for me where I had to then turn uh, attention to it and I think to you know as I said to then we were we were rum but we were very small and I think acquiring a brand as prestigious as, as Martin Dorley was a kind of a real motivator if you like to uh, to sort of be involved and to take rum to sort of as high a level as it could um, Martin Dorley had been uh, either the earliest or, or one of the very earliest brands to have been exported from Barbados as a brand as opposed to historic um, bulk export. And so that, that, you know, once you acquire that brand, it just changed the whole outlook of, you know, our our perspectives on rum and taking rum into the export market. So things changed, things changed dramatically. Yeah, well, I'm not nearly as colorful as Richard is. I don't have the history. Um, well, no, I have the history, but I'm so, I don't have the history, but I'm certainly colorful. <laughs> Does that sound right, Rich? Yeah, I think you okay. got it right. Yeah. Um, so my family has only been a part of the rum industry for, what, 10 years now. Uh, Hamden was a part of a privatization exercise that the government was divesting some assets in Jamaica. And uh, Hamden, yeah, it's been around since 1753, but in Jamaica, nobody knows about it. <laughs> That's because uh, it was, uh, it, they only specialized in bulk rum. Uh, and that's what we're known for. And that's why you have so many, well, Hamden is quite famed over, you know, on this side of the world in certain circles, in our lovely rum circle per, uh, particularly. But uh, in Jamaica, nobody knows of it. And that's because everything was shipped out in bulk and then it made a name for itself through independent bottlers, etc. Uh, but we came about in uh, 10 years ago. Uh, we we uh, acquired it through the privatization exercise. My family actually wasn't interested in the rum. Uh, we knew nothing about it. We, we were interested in a sugar factory. My grandfather was a farmer. He was always, you know, sugar was king when he was a farmer, when he was a boy. And it was his dream to own a sugar factory one day. Of course, it was a pipe dream. I mean, he was a poor farmer. And obviously, decades later, he was able to put in a bid for this uh, acquisition. And 
we won the bid as a family. I think probably one of the reasons is it wasn't just the dollar value, but also the fact that we were Jamaican. Mm. There were a lot of foreign entities that were, that were bidding on it. So we acquired Long Pond Sugar Factory, not to be confused with Long Pond Rum Distillery. We actually share the same, we, we share a gate, but it's completely different. Uh, and with that came the Hamden Distiller, Distillery. Geographically, it's 45 minutes away by car. Well, maybe 55 with the potholes, but uh, that's what we acquired. We knew nothing of it. Uh, we heard that, you know, it was supposed to be special. We walked in there and we're like, this is out of a Ch- Charles Dickens novel. You know, the board floors were going to give way once you stepped on them and you were scared, uh, you know, you're going to drop through the floor. The ceiling was going to come down crashing on you. And we certainly believe that this was an absolute robbery. We're like, why would they give this to us? This, somebody has, you know, somebody has wished terrible things on our family. And lo and behold, we meet people that teach us over the years that this is really a gem. Uh, the workers at the distillery, some, they knew that. Um, however, I don't think they really realized how much, how, how important it is to the framework of rum internationally because they don't have they don't they don't understand the context but they knew it was special and that's something that they tried to impart on us so uh traveled a bit we started with the brand rum file uh quite blindly went into that uh, i will admit and i decided to take it on the road as marketing director and so i started to meet all these people on this side of the world that really have given me the knowledge and have, have allowed us to really value it and position it where it needs to be positioned now. Uh, I've known Richard for what, a few years now, right, Rich? Yeah, but four, well, five, been, five years now? Uh, it well, been one of your first trips, I think it was Germany, one of your first trips. I think it was Germany was one of your first export missions with uh, Rumfire that we met, yeah. Yeah, but I thought you hated me. I th- you were so standoffish. It, honestly, for like the first few years. Not years. Maybe the first few days. No, no, no. no. I'm, I'm telling you, I was terrified. I thought you were the most awful man. You had no... Edit this part, hey. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. No. Uh, no, this is a very common... Uh, this is a very common problem I have. No. Yeah, no, the funny thing is, actually, uh, you know, a few years now, Gail and I have been very good friends, yeah. Richard's wife, and the, the truth is that he, she said to me a few years ago, he's actually a really big teddy bear. I looked at her and I was like, woman, I don't know what you are smoking. <laughs> but the truth is, he really is. He's a wonderful guy. So, luckily, because of relationships like this, particular, actually, particularly this relationship, it's what... Um, has actually allowed Hamden to be positioned in the way that it currently is because it's through my relationship with Richard that I then met Luca um, and through my relationship with Luca um, we've, we've been able to launch Hamden Estate uh, in the way it really ought to have been so I'm done with my introduction <laughs> <laughs> I love it yeah sure, sure. Just, to ex- yeah. just to explain this which I hinted at when in in, in, in my own uh, scenario um, there's a separation historic separation between distillery and bottled brand um, and this is not dissimilar for example to scotch whiskey um, you know the first bottled brand of single malt is the 60s it's Glenfiddich I mean the distilleries sell so so you know, they sell uh, product to, to, to bottlers and blenders. Um, and you had this same model in the, in the Caribbean. And uh, too much, it, we don't have enough time to go into how, how we how that we evolve that way. But I think, because I, I think people today don't quite understand how you could have a distillery and not a brand, but you need to understand that in, in, in this era, you're making commodities and a rural estate doesn't have the infrastructure to, um, you know, become a, a distributed brand. Uh, it's a different era, and you have to you have to look through the right lens. Um, so estates like Hamden and uh, and Long Pond and Money Musk and all of these are estates that sold. And the same thing in Barbados, we just don't have as many of them. They would sell 
to in bulk. Uh, and let, let's actually give you an example of Barbados. It was actually the law in Barbados that distilleries could only sell in bulk. And this was a way of protecting businesses, protecting government taxation. There was a whole myriad of reasons. Uh, and that's why you have, for example, um, uh, historic blenders like uh, Ray and Nephew, who were independent of any distillery, or Fred Myers, who were independent of any distillery um, originally. Uh, and as I say, my family, we were independent of any distillery historically when we purchased uh, the Foursquare Estate, which I had not, not, not made rum in over 100 years. It had been closed for a few years as a sugar factory. Uh, then, then we moved. Obviously, we all rum, all of our rum brands would would ultimately be produced at Foursquare. So um, this was a very normal situation, as they say, for to have an estate uh, that didn't have a brand. And so, you know, one of the the major impacts of Christelle's family taking over Hamden was the move to have their own brands which is why we see brands like Hamden and Foursquare to this day, today. You know, just to, I guess, bring in another lens to that as well, it's something that has happened a lot in the wine world as well, and potentially even over that same sort of period, in the last sort of 10 years, you've had smallish producers who, historically, they've just been selling grapes. Correct, yes. They've exactly. just been, this yeah. This model is, uh, yeah. I mean, yeah. you've got small cognac farmers and yeah. small wine farmers. Exactly. Uh, yes. Um, because, you know, let's remember the whole concept of branding and bottling is relatively young. Um, you know, whiskey and rum were first moving into bottles, I think, what, late 19th century, something like this. So we forget... Um, that you know, spirit making and wine making are so much more older than than branding. Yeah. So you have these what looks like an anomaly today, where you have a distillery with other brand, uh, but as you can see, that that's changing. So, I mean, when we acquired Foursquare Estate, for example, and refurbished it and and put it back into making rum again, um, you know, that was kind of a priority for us was to you know to put Foursquare on a label. Mm -hmm. Uh, even though we had historic brands, in, brands that were independent of any distillery, we wanted to get the brand brand on the distillery. And, you know, that's the same thing that's happened over, I mean, in, well, they, you started first with Rum Fire, but, you know, it was a work in progress eventually to get Hamden on a, on a label and done the right way. And, of course, you had to build the age stocks and all the rest of it, so... This doesn't necessarily have to be a you know a, 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 a deep dive necessarily, but I'm just curious as well then because you're saying okay you've you've got essentially you know the word I've written down here is bottling you know and and essentially distillation bottling branding I mean we it feels like we've we've so we've been talking about you know distillation and the history we've been talking about building a brand and you know traveling and going out sort of into the market I'm just wondering then you know how how have these Brands or, or you know, these new brands who have been distilling for all these years, how how do they sort of go about getting that bottling knowledge? Is is it something quite specialized that they need to sort of acquire? And is there a sort of a you know a, a skills gap that I guess you had to overcome when you when you first thought, okay, we're gonna we're gonna bottle this and do this sort of you know all under one roof, as it were? Well, no, not for us. I mean, we we as they say, our 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 heritage is as a blender and bottler. You know, some of my Great grandfather, nineteen twenties. For uh, Christelle, yes, that was the new experience of aging rum and blending and bottling rum, <laughs> and and coffee as well. And coffee, yes, in front of me. Well, I can tell you, we had no idea what we were doing. Let's just be let's just be very honest. I think we thought we knew what we were doing, as yeah. usually when you're doing something new, you 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 go into it and you think you know what you're doing. In retrospect, however, we had no idea. I mean, come on. We, we knew nothing of the beverage industry, nothing about spirits. I thought when I learned how rum was made at Hamden that that's how all rum was made. I didn't even know what a, what, what a column still was. I thought all stills were like that, and that's the thing that they make the rum in. Uh, so let's just say we knew. I, I knew nothing. Um, we're quick learners, though. To be honest, I mean, it, apart from rum, every industry that my family has ever been in, 
they they knew nothing about it when they went into it. So that's to do with uh, retail, pharmacy, uh, dry cleaning, uh, hotel, bar, restaurants. Uh, so we're quick studies, but I, I think the sugar industry is a little bit different. That one kind of rinsed us, <laughs> to be truthful. Um, luckily with rum, we, we acquired relationships in the bulk rum business, and that we maintained. But for the bottling, uh, creating a brand, we went into it blindly. Uh, we got some, you know, we, we retooled an, an old bottling line, uh, got some some new equipment as well. And uh, that's how we went into it. The Rum Fire was a brand. We were like, oh, okay, so we want to put this stuff in a bottle because it's supposed to be good. So how do we do that? We don't have any age stocks. Started putting down barrels. Obviously, have to wait on time for that. Which but was a genius decision. Well, that was my, my late grandfather's decision. So, yes, I do agree. It was a genius decision. Thank you, Richard. Um, and w- we, we bottled at 63% because we thought that that was the benchmark for overproof rum in Jamaica. Uh, if you can't make an aged rum, you make an overproof rum. That's, that was the thinking behind it. So... There wasn't really... I mean, yeah, the skill set that was employed was from the workers that were already there. And, I mean, practices that were handed down and thank God we maintained. Uh, I think there, there there might have been a thought at one point in time, a consideration to, you know, ramp up production. Let's get this thing moving faster. Why wait two weeks of fermentation? Uh, luckily, we did not do that. Luckily, we did not change anything. Uh, so... Part of it was just really good luck that we didn't touch anything that wasn't supposed to be touched. And um, creating something out of nothing that we knew nothing about. Uh, the branding of Rumfire is <laughs> controversial. <laughs> I, I personally, I mean, I, I can probably say this on record. I think most people that know me know me quite well. I didn't like the branding of Rumfire. Once I started to understand that it really did not fit into the position of the positioning of what I wanted Hamden Estate to be mm-hmm. and what it ought to be. Um, once I understood that, I did not appreciate the branding of Rumfire. But you don't know what you know until you know what you know mm-hmm. and what you don't know, mm-hmm. you know? So that was a lot of no's. <laughs> So that's that's really how it started. It wasn't a particular, you know, we didn't do we didn't hire a, a company to do it for us, and it was it was just kind of, you know, fake it till you make it. And now to go back to Rum File, uh, it's been almost ten years, and I think it kind of works now. There was an article that was written the other day that um, one of the bartenders said it's just the best kind of trouble. Or is the you know it's like when you look at the when you look at it you just know it's the best kind of trouble to get into, and so we're sticking with that. I'm actually uh, bringing it back soon. So well, I think I think now that you've you've got Hamden Estate well established, I think it's I think it's okay for you to have the the, the rum fire on the as the as the was it trouble uh, brand, but um, mm. yeah, I think when it was sort of representing Hamden, yeah, people were upset. But I just want to go back to this point about because you know it was a genius decision to age and age at the level you did, and people probably hearing that probably think, oh, hang on, I mean, that's not very, uh, you know, they probably think it was obvious, but they don't know what the rum industry and the outlooks were years ago. Um, and what, what sort of aging are we talking about then? What sort of? I mean, even people will say, even within the very small rum community that will buy, you know, some independent Bali Hamden, they don't understand that that's that's a few hundred bottles. That's not something that can sustain a, a distillery or an aging program. That's a that's that's um, you know. Independent bottlers buying a well, it it starts with sheer buying a, a, a quantities of Hamden for the various blends etc. and putting down a handful of casks, and a handful of casks being sold to independent bottlers a few you know a few hundred bottles. So when they made a decision that they're going to start an aging program at Hamden, this took tremendous courage. Uh, we didn't know what we were doing. Well, exactly. That was perfect. <laughs> that brave, right? Yeah. And of course, now you're the you know the reaping the benefits of that decision. Yeah. Um, and like, I mean, and just to mirror um, 
Hamden's uh, and Christelle's uh, perspective, while bottling a brand was new to her 10 years ago, 20 years ago, export was new to us. And the same way, we made huge mistakes um, uh, because we we didn't know what we were doing. And to you know, and to be fair, we actually. Uh, listened a little bit too much to to people on this side which who would say to you well rum has to be cheap rum has to be this rum mm. instead of us saying well this is this is the rum we make let's go and find a market yeah. for it yeah. Yeah. we were too dictated to in trying to adapt our rum to this market instead of the other way around instead of really realizing no you can find a, a niche for authentic rum, the most important thing you have to do is to actually make the the genuine authentic article. That's where you're going to find a niche, not bend into fit with the mass brands. I mean, it's completely useless. For example, a Hamden or a Four Square to go and try and and you know make a Bacardi or a Captain Morgan but when you first come in the market that's the kind of people you talk to and they yeah. they're the, they think you want to you know sell 2 million cases of a of a brand for 14 pound 99 and to be quite honest 20 years ago you, you, a little bit you think that's what you're supposed to do mm-hmm. you don't realize that no you can develop rum as you want to develop it and you can sell the very best uh, rums you can make it, that it, it is it is possible so you it, it takes a little while for you to learn that so yes as you say you started with a rum fire because you kind of thought well that's what i'm supposed to do now you're making lovely ham the hamden great estate rum and i'm releasing lovely four squares and we're both doing what we really want to do we finished the rum series last time with dawn and pretty much spent the whole episode on classification and then we you know had a pretty incredible tasting of examples of really each of those different styles and i guess yeah the whiskey exchange and the dawn davies approach to to classification so really kind of keep it quite broad and open yeah well, like what is your i guess current view on i guess the current classification and you know what will kind of help rum evolve and you know move forward and, and maintain those gains that that it's made in recent years and you know potentially what might need to change going forward. You, <laughs> Christelle's pointing at me. Yeah, I'm pointing at you. you. Boy, well, that's a long, uh, that's a long <laughs> subject <laughs> where to start. But um, it, I think that, uh, uh, the point is well actually illustrated with something like Hamden very, very well. So uh, rum uh, ended up with color classification, and there's a historic reason behind that. And this is not not and the, and and uh, I can emphasize this is not something we used really at home, uh, or at least not in the way it's used over here. For example, we never used words like gold um, or even dark. Uh, we certainly used white rum um, back at home. Uh, but as I said, the point is well illustrated because when you say there's something called white rum, and you put on a shelf a Hamden in the same category with a Bacardi um, those are completely different rums made in completely different ways it's um, I don't even think I can give you an analog in in whiskey as how far apart that is mm. um, that's like putting a, a heavily peated single malt up against um, I don't know give me a very simple <laughs> green whiskey brand you know um, night and day uh, and so that kind of heresy doesn't take place in the other categories. Um, you know, you don't have this mm-hmm. this two completely extreme extremes yeah. lumped together, whether on a whether on a shelf in a store, whether on a menu, whether at a trade show. You might see uh, those two brands next to one another, and so so we have this absurdity in which we we. Uh, we needed to deal with, and then the other other part of it as well is, um, you know, rum uh, mirrors Scotch whiskey in the sense that rum is made either in one hundred percent in pot stills, 
or rum is blended, pot stills and column stills, or it's made entirely in column stills. And, you know, without trying to go into too much detail here, but effectively, you know, the pot still is the original true artisanal process. Mm -hmm. And so the idea, again, that you don't make the distinction between something that uh, costs dramatically more to produce, uh, you know, in from the sort of mass produce, you know, uh, I mean, a pot still will take, you know, eight or nine hours to make a batch that might be done in about 15 minutes in a multi-column, huge industrial size uh, uh, distillery. And we literally have examples on the shelf. Because of this absence of proper categorization, people take full advantage which is actually the same thing that happens in vodka. So you would literally have on a shelf mass-produced, uh, no-age statement rums selling for several times, you know, at the super premium pricing, mm -hmm. and wonderful artisanal rums for the simple reason that their brands are not well-known, completely and utterly undervalued. Uh, so, so the only way to correct this absurdity and to protect the legacy of the artisanal rums. In other words, you know, why was the government divest in Hamden? Because it was undervalued, and it's undervalued because of the lack of the proper communication. Yeah. Um, so the only way these, thing, these, these kind of rums are going to survive is proper communication, and proper communication is with pro proper classification. Yeah. <laughs> I approve this message. You know, um, it's funny. When I talk about rum, going back to rum file, yeah. I really didn't understand. We, we didn't understand uh, how, how it would be unhelpful to the development of Hamden Estate and what that brand is or would be. Because we didn't have any vision for that. Um, we thought nobody knew, knows Hamden anyway, so why is that going to be something that's eventually going to be valued highly? Um, similarly, I created Hamden Gold. What on earth is that? I mean, now I, I, I actually am really against it because I don't think it stands for what Hamden Estate is. or It doesn't stand for what, you know, the communication that I choose to put out there now because it's a colored rum. Uh, there's no sugar added, obviously. Uh, we use caramel for coloring. But we created it because when we, when I came over to Germany, that was like the first show I ever went to with uh, Rum File, I heard, oh, well, they wanted a dark rum. And I didn't really know what that meant. I just know it didn't have any aged rum, so I went and created it. Now that you see that that communication is completely the opposite to what I want to be communicated. And so for that reason, in retrospect, I would have never done that product. Um, I'll probably keep it on the Jamaican market because we we tend to, we have Trelawney Gold. We have, you know, we have these products that it, it works kind of in the country. It works in rural communities. Um, and I don't have a problem there. But insofar as the communication of what Hamden Estate is as a heritage brand, it's completely opposite to what, you know, we created some years ago as something that was going to put Hamden on the map. It's it, that's why it's important to do away with the colors, as as Richard has has so well taught me. <laughs> it's more important to really create, to uh, uh, mimic exactly what you want. You want a vision for a heritage brand. Mm -hmm. you can't you can't you can't do that by putting color classifications into the system. It doesn't work. So. Yeah, what he said. <laughs> yeah. Okay, okay. And I'm just curious... But just, but just to take a step back there with mm -hmm. color, when Christelle mentions she's, you know, selling a colored rum in, in um, Trelawney, the thing to understand is that the use of color in rum is uh, centuries old. Um, and I think today one of the challenges we have in rum is... Um, is that uh, again? So pe people see s certain things through through their lens. So um, some people see color through the lens of you know Scotch whiskey or the lens of you know 2019. 
not realizing how old the use of color is in, in, in rum, which is probably the roots, uh, my guess is probably the roots of using color as classification outside. Let me explain. So historically, rum would have been sold, uh, the vast majority of rum sold in places like Barbados and Jamaica is on age. It's not to say it wasn't, there was not age rum. There's, there's some, you know, spectacular age rums right through history uh, i think people know of you know the famous rain fu 17 and myers mona 28 years old and all of these uh, fabulous age rums but just the same way that our rums appeal to a niche in the uk these high-end rums are also a niche in barbados and jamaica and barbados and jamaica are small places so a niche there is very small uh so the va- ma- vast majority of rum is sold on age, but it was always historically sold as white or colored. We never used words gold and dark. And it was exported in colored form. It was bulk rum was purchased by the English buyers, and a color was specified. Um, and they used to have color charts, a specification, and you would, you know, in the old days, you would literally have these um, comparators to compare, and you would, you would put the caramel color in. Uh, which is not sweet caramel, not bak- you know, not baker's caramel, but but a caramel color. It was made on the estate, and you made the rum colored, and that's what we called it. And that word is actually because of its uh, other uh, very inappropriate use has gone out of, of of use, thankfully. So it kind of got replaced. Um, well, a lot of people in the Caribbean will also say red rum or they will say brown rum. But, you know, I can remember as a boy colored rum and I can show you ad, ad, advertisements for rum, white or colored. And as they say, people today, you know, like color, they'll say to me, oh, you use color, uh, you're a hypocrite, you're, um, you're deceiving on age. And they don't know your history. They're, they're, they're seeing it through 2019 lens. And they don't understand that, you know, for um, 95% of my family's existence, we never even sold age rum. We sold white or colored, same price. So it's no deception. It was white, colored rum literally came in two colors. Um, and so over in England, that's where your legacy of all these very dark rums and the Navy rum's very dark and all these Woods Navy and Lamb's Navy brands, they were all colored rum. Uh, and then... Uh, I could be wrong, but I think it started, uh, it may have started earlier, but I think I remember when Diageo first, well, it was the forerunner to Diageo, first imported a, a Barbados rum, uh, and they they called it, you know, gold, because they wanted to distinguish it from the t- typical English rums. And somehow gold became... Uh, widely used so when we ended up with terms like white gold and dark which we never used in the caribbean we used white and colored so color has always been there so um as christelle says you know so that she then had the request from germany oh we want a color we want well we want a dark rum but that doesn't mean yeah we did that that you don't sell it in jamaica but the whole idea now when you're the thing is to understand that when we come in these markets, we are going after the best thing for us is not to, to, to come with the rum that we necessarily sell to everyone at home, but the niche rum yeah, yeah. Uh, and find a niche here, which we also sell. So like at home, I sell my, hand, my high-end four squares, but when it comes to selling those, 90% of my business is export. Because Barbados is a small place, it's not because Barbadians don't drink high-end rums. It's just a question that if you look at the, the, the share of the market, if you like, I still have a bigger share at home. It's just that Barbados is a small place. So you come abroad with your best rums because you're still niche, but you're now niche in a much bigger, uh, bigger uh, market. Okay, okay. And... Um it's super interesting because, yeah, you, you're bringing together a lot of things there in your answer. You're bringing together that, yeah, it, it, you, you are going after, a, you know, I guess kind of the, the rum heads over here, the people that, yes. you know, have a, 
you know, often I think if I bring it across from the wine world, obviously it's, it's uh, qu- you know, quite exacting standards. You know, the, the, it's almost like you've got to tick a lot of boxes with these guys to, 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 yes. to, to, be, to be considered. And maybe on the other side of that, once you have ticked a lot of those boxes, they're prepared to pay Yes. A premium, you know, then almost, almost, you know, if they can afford it, you know, you know, price sensitivity kind of goes out the window because they know that they're getting the real deal. Yes. You know, they're getting the, the real the real stuff. Um, and then I'm just curious, any kind of nowadays, you know, when you're having those types of conversations, what are those criteria? What are the, the kind of checkpoints, you know, the kind of the. Uh, you know, proof of proof points, I guess, that people are sort of asking you about it. You know, is is it around the distillation style? Is it around the aging? You know, it, it, give us a sense of you know what are those types of conversations. Uh, yeah. Well, exactly, the communications of value. It, again, it's 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 mirrored in every spirit. Um, mm. You know, the people who pay the higher prices, the the the, the collectors, the mm. serious spirit enthusiasts. You know, not the person buying necessarily a, a gift for someone who you know goes for the flashiest package yeah. but the knowledgeable buyer um and that's where obviously you know our our rums play in yeah they're looking they're looking to tick boxes like the rum is pure in other words the rum has not been adulterated with sugar or other flavorings um this is why again this this issue with like for a color so for example our four squares don't have color the hamlins don't have color uh, you know, uh, but I still emphasize that Barbados and Jamaica use color, and I need people to understand that that's not considered a nefarious or deceptive practice at home. That, mm-hmm. it, a, a, as I say, a lot of people who add things like sugar and stuff, they're desperately trying to claim that these were traditions, um, which is, of course, grossly uh, misleading and, and false. But color was a tradition. In other words, it, that is a color is ubiquitous. But having said all that, if you buy a bottle of Foursquare and a bottle of Hamden, there's no color in it. But uh, it, it is part of our culture. So, so some of them, yes, want to see it's not colored. They want to see it's not chill filtered. So, and of course, one of the other uh, sort of interesting debates that's coming up is aged at home. Mm. So there are many independent bottle, many. Many enthusiasts of brands like Hamlin, because they have a history of buying ones that were aged in Europe, they're not necessarily against the aging in Europe, but they're certainly supportive of, of us where we want more transparency or where it's aged. I mean, our, our perspective is that, you know, you could take a four square and a Hamlin rum and age it, as Luca says, you could age it in Patagonia and it'll mm-hmm. never be a bad rum. Mm-hmm. We're a little bit about semantics, but semantics are important. If I write on a label, 10-year-old Hamden rum, we believe that should be 10 years at Hamden. If I write 10-year-old Foursquare rum, it should be 10 years at Foursquare. That doesn't mean that we're against someone making brand Y and they buy the ten- rum from Hamden and they age it wherever they want to age it and they create brand Y um, and they think that this... Jamaican rum aged in country wherever makes brand Y and they think it's the greatest thing and that's fine let them do that but Hamden brand Foursquare brand must be to bear that name they must be aged at source so we think that's important um, uh, but they say that's a little bit more uh, not really controversial but there's uh, as I say, people are, are quite happy because of a history. They're quite happy to buy European age uh, rums. Um, so that, as I say, and then, yes, and then when it comes to things like classification, they want to know that there's a genuine artisanal process behind these things. They don't want to know it came from a big, massive uh, industrial size plant. But they go hand in hand. You see, that's the key. If I'm using pot stills and coffee stills I'm getting my flavor from the rum the rum is distilled with the flavor in it so therefore I'm not going to reach for additives and it's the other way around when the when the rum comes off of uh, multi-column and it's flavorless and they want it to taste premium they're the ones reaching for the PX sherry and all of these things to add so it goes hand in hand um so yes, I mean people are getting much more confident about certain brands and certain category of rum. And 
you will find there's no great mystery if you look at the historic producers. The historic producers are giving you the rums that people want. The flavor is genuine. They're not additives. So whether it's, you know, Hamden, Worthy Park in Jamaica, Appleton in Jamaica, Mount Gay, us in Barbados, you know, the French, Nissan, St. James, Clement. If you're looking at historic producers, you are finding uh, they are ticking all the boxes that, 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 that our customers want. Okay, okay. So as I said earlier, when, uh, when I first saw Hamden, I thought that's how all rum was made. <laughs> yeah. um, fast forward a few years, I learned that was not at all the case. Yeah. So Hamden's fermentation is quite special. Uh, yeah, we can talk about it all we want, but unless you go, it's it, to be completely honest, it's something that you you have to experience. You have to be there to experience it in its in its full vibrancy. I would say um, we have a long fermentation, open air, uh, cedar vats. Uh, it's a huge ferment. Well, not a huge. It's a, a fermentation house within the distillery. Um, and a long fermentation, anywhere between 10 and 14 days. And you just have to kind of wait for it. Uh, there's the, it's much more an art than, I think, a science. Um, and uh, I've never seen anything like it anywhere else. Uh, I, don't know, I don't know. I don't know. I don't really know. I mean, what else to say? It's, it's, it's extremely long. It's one of the reasons why uh, our output is capped in yeah. a certain way. I think uh, the fermentation, there are lots of words thrown, ar- thrown around all the time when you talk about Hamden production. There's the dunder, there's the, the muck pit. Uh, I think people always think that those things are the same, one and the same, and that's, that that's really not the case at all. Um, and they're very specific parts of our production and uh, you can't they can't be replicated actually that's one of the things so a couple of years ago there were there were these crazy stories being thrown around about different things that were being used in our production and i didn't know where this was coming from and when i looked into it and did some research i realized that nobody really knew anything about hamlin's production so there was this air of mystery around it and so i said to the master distiller at the time uh vivian wisdom i said mr wisdom why is it that we're so secretive about what happens at Hamden? He said, well, nobody really ever cared before because it was never a brand. You know, we just sold it in bulk. So, yeah, there are these geeks over on that side of the world that are into it, but there's nothing for them. There's no resource for them to understand our production process. I said, so... Can we start telling the story? Because I want to start dispelling these stupid, you know, rumors that there are these different things being used in our production, bats and and goat heads and all these ridiculous things. I mean, the closest thing that we have is actually I saw a, a very big jackfruit in our yard one day. It was it was decaying. I thought it was an animal carcass. It was so large. And so for a second, I thought to myself, oh, my goodness, it's really true. But no, it was jackfruit. (laughs) So I I wanted to dispel those rumors. I said, can we start telling the story of Hamden's production? He says, yeah, because I've worked at, you know, every distillery in Jamaica. And there's no way if I wanted to recreate Hamden rum, any other distillery or vice versa, um, it could never be done. So... Hamden and its production process is absolute to Hamden ge- geographically. Um, our water is extremely important. Uh, our source is a, a dam, a natural dam that's less than three miles. It's three miles away and it's piped, um, gravity fed. And that is, up. I mean, we can't make Hamden run without that water. So that's extremely important. And uh, our production process, uh, we can go into it for, for hours, but the muck pit that is uh, on basically eight feet below the fermentation house, um, our uh, Hamden Graves, uh, that is basically our insurance. Um, that's super important. And yeah, I think that all of that really uh, builds... A, uh, brings together what is fermentation at Hamden because you can't make you can't do the fermentation without any of those factors so 
that's what people that that's that's how they build their value i think that's one of the very important um probably the most important aspect of production i have then i know that yeah you're both on the road a lot you're out there you're talking you know you're engaging with the market um you know we're sat here in london this is you know rum week there's a big rum fest this weekend so you know there's a there's a lot of talking to to come and a lot of you know people to sort of um influence and i'm just yeah it'd be great to just get you to maybe you know take a little step back from that and you know all of that effort that you're you're putting in there i mean is, do you do you see that as you know mainly to satisfy the curiosity that's already been generated based on you know all of the the good work that you've done previously or is it also a big part of that to to bring new people into the fold and to you know dispel myths and to um you know ensure i guess that there's future and there's people sort of still being drawn into the category and and being drawn towards the brands oh yeah we're still we're still you know we want to broaden um our base in other words um, we're still, you know, while super pre- premium rum has grown, uh, as a share of the sort of total super premium market, rum is still tiny. I mean, we're still dwarfed by um, Scotch whiskey. Uh, so the, 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 the our potential audience is it's still um, huge. Uh, and, and, and that's very much our audience. In other words... Um, you know, don't want to be rude, but you know, the guy drinking Sailor Jerry or Captain Morgan is is not trading up. He is not our audience. Mm-hmm. Uh, he or she is not our audience, um, and, and that's fine. There's a play. You know, er- everyone doesn't have to be a spirits enthusiast. Mm-hmm. Uh, no, the, our audience is just that: the spirits enthusiast, and that person is most likely at this point in time to be enjoying a range of whiskies. And our mission is to include in his uh, interests some very good rums. Uh, and that's why we were at things like the Whiskey Show. And that's why we're doing the things we're doing. If we were more about branding, we would be able to sit back at home and uh, and plan marketing strategies. But as small family-owned businesses who are trying to sell products based on their quality and their authenticity this is the way you have to do it you have to go and talk to your customer you have to go and share the room with them um they want that i mean if someone is you know people people who are buying our rooms these as i say these are enthusiasts these are getting people who get great pleasure out of when they crack open a bottle of rum or a bottle of whiskey and by interacting and teaching them more and people who are going to be listening to this, mm-hmm. you're enhancing the experience mm-hmm. that they get when they buy it. And that's what it's all about. So if you don't do this part, um, you you know, you're taken away from the, the potential experience. And of course it works both ways because, you know, for us, I think we, we, we enjoy going out and discovering people, uh, enthusiastically rums I think Christelle is now um, suddenly has memories of last night <laughs> of too many people enjoying too much of the rum <laughs> yeah I mean yeah this, uh... I mean I'll say it. Hamden Hamden Estate is in its infancy as much as we'd uh, like to... Uh, uh, for a distillery that goes back to 1753. Yeah, it, it goes back to 1753, but Hamden Estate is in its, abs- it's in its infancy. It's a year old. Um, yeah, we can sit down here and talk about it as fans, and you know we kind of have a skewed uh, perception of uh, perhaps how important it is, because we know how important it is to the rum industry. But the average person doesn't know that. Even this, as as Richard is talking about, you know, somebody enjoying Scotch whiskey, yeah. they've never heard of Hamden. Yeah, they've heard, maybe heard of Hamden Park in Scotland, but they've certainly never heard of Hamden <laughs> Estate in Jamaica. <clears throat> so for me, although I have a great distribution partner internationally um, with a hell of a lot of credibility, it's important for me to be able to get in front of my potential 
customer or enthusiast and be able to give validation and give a little bit more of a Jamaican story and uh, identity to the brand because it is really just born. And it's important for me in its infancy to be able to plant that seed as much as I possibly can. Although, I, I mean, rum isn't the only thing that I do, so I can't be on the road as much as I'd like, which is probably very good for my liver. But because uh, <laughs> I clearly like to enjoy myself when I come on these things. <laughs> but it's important for me to be able to give a little bit of the Jamaican story to the brand. Although I can't be everywhere, I do it as much as I can because I think that's really, really important at this particular time. Yeah, it's been yeah really awesome sitting down with you both. It's been you know a conversation that I've been looking forward to for a long, long time. Um, and I, yeah, I want to finish it in a slightly different way, I guess. Um, to you normally just sort of ask a, a broad, open question, but I, you know, I'm, I'm really kind of curious. And a, a word that I've written down, even you know, before sitting down today, was media, and uh, it just seems to make a lot of sense. You know, being as you say, you know, not from the largest islands not from the largest producers uh your markets being you know relatively far away you know and you know there's other things that you got to focus on and other other things in your life so you can't always be here you know much as we i'm sure we'd love to have you here every week you know you you can't be here every week um so i'm just yeah we just want to kind of pick your brains a little bit and maybe get you to share you know what what, is, what are your thoughts around media that can i guess you know tell that jamaican story and tell the story of the distillation and and kind of be your ambassadors when you're back home or you know when you're doing other things what, what are your sort of ideas around that you're, you're the, the marketing. Uh, uh, no, yes. no, 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 no. Actually, okay, so that's all a farce. <laughs> the truth, the truth is, the reason why I have the title of marketing director is because when my grandfather was ill and I went back to Jamaica, um, they wanted to, they wanted to entice me to stay, so they had to give me some form of title, the, so that I would feel important, I believe. Um, and it was marketing director. That's what was chosen for me. Uh, I, I'm, I I have a nice smile. <laughs> I don't know if that counts. But um, no, media is, is, is obviously super important. But for me, we don't have the ability as a small brand, as a tiny, you know, spec. Uh, we don't have the ability to really, our reach is limited. And so... For me, it's more important. Like this, this what we're doing right now is super important to me because that's where I can reach my audience best. Uh, we don't have the resources to really go far and wide. And the second, I, even even in Jamaica, the second I try to do anything, the big boys will come and just they'll outdo me ten times over. So it's really important for me to be able to reach my particular audience uh, using channels like this that are very specific. And, uh, you know, it's, it's important to, 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 to not overreach because we just don't have the resources to do that. We have to remember, you know, you have, you, yeah, you can aim high, but you have to be very specific. And that's what we try to do because otherwise well, we won't exist. <laughs> Your expenses will just, you know. So I don't know. That's it's 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 quite simple for me. I don't know if Richard has any more being, being here in person and, and reaching yeah. reaching our audience yeah. very specifically where I know they're going to be listening. I know they're going to be seeing. Other than that, I think we're quite limited. So yeah, I think I think people sometimes underappreciate, especially when we come over here, how small we actually are. <laughs> Um, I think actually even back at home, people uh, uh, underappreciate, you know, people will say to me, um, you know, have you got your rum in Tesco's? <laughs> they don't quite understand that that's, that's just not an area for us at all. Um, or, or they don't understand, well, you know, why we don't have a wonderful full page ad in the Times, you know, Be because you do those things at home. You know, I can afford a full page ad at, at, you know, at home. But yeah, I can't. <laughs> no, well, not very often, I should say, but it has happened in the past. Um, so, yes, uh, things um, above the line media, as the, the guys uh, call it, you know, yeah, it's impossible for us. It's all about um, reaching the customers directly. And, of course, um, that infamous tool of uh, social media. Well, yeah. 
but social media has um one of the things I you know I got asked about this a little while back and and I made I made the observation and and um that um that in many ways the big brands tended to use social media in the exact same way they use any media so you know they see their pages and this latest yeah it's uh here's our product in a pretty cocktail etc whereas smaller uh entities like us have have used social media in a completely different way so what we've done is is to interact directly uh, with our consumer use social media to, to do that so I reach and speak to Foursquare enthusiasts directly in a way that was impossible before uh, social media um, so that that for me is and, and I you know and I get a lot of criticism for that well, you're on Facebook right <laughs> <laughs> and I get a lot of criticism for that um Saying that you know, no, I need that. I need to behave more um, professionally, or uh, uh, do things in a more conventional way. Uh, I do actually do that subtly. Um, so, You're for example, you, you should be more. yeah, in other words, more conventionally, yes. But we actually do do that. I actually run. I mean, like on on you know on our social media, I have a, a, a Foursquare page which does. Um, yeah. behave very very well but does not but we do not engage in the usual fluff on the four square so we still and then anything that's a little more um, I don't want to say controversial but anything that's a little more um, uh, where I'm speaking on industry topics I'll do it on my personal page um, so I do I do draw a little a little line um, uh, between where it goes <laughs> Uh, I don't draw a line on what, what might go on, so, but yes, but that's very important. But but that's I think people find most people find that refreshing that um, uh, they can communicate directly, and um, you know they can find out um, you know how we feel about certain things, not necessarily going through a, a PR media filter, um, you know, and, and um, you know statements that are all um, sanitized and polished and. You know, if small family-owned brands like us can't be sort of brutally honest, who, who, who will be? Thank you so much, Richard. Thank you so much, Christelle. It was an absolute pleasure sitting down with you. And I feel like you shared a lot here, both for the novice and for the experienced rum drinker alike. If you're listening to this in mid-October 2019, do keep an eye out for all the rum events that will be taking place in London for Rum Week including the 13th UK Rum Fest, which takes place on the 19th and 20th of October. Do, of course, check out Four Square Distillery and Hamden Estate below, where I've included both their main social media handles and also details of the Facebook groups where you can get involved in the discussion. And if you've enjoyed this episode, do head on over to interpretingwine.com forward slash listen for details of how to listen to the podcast and to subscribe. And I'd love to have your feedback on this very special episode. Do hop over onto social media where I'm at Interpreting Wine on Instagram and Facebook, at Wine Podcast on Twitter, or email hello at interpretingwine.com. See you next time.